Dog Hammerquelt once said, I don't know who or what put the question. I don't know when it was put. I don't even remember answering. But at some moment, I did answer yes to someone or something, and from that hour, I was certain that existence is meaningful and that, therefore, my life and self-surrender had a goal. Augustine once said that to search for God is to have found God. Augustine also said, tell me why you mean so much to me. The purpose of life and the pursuit of the divine. On late Monday afternoon, I was on my bike. A nation in mourning. The president had said, let's unite and come together. Thoughts and prayers as a nation with the people of Las Vegas, the victims' families. So there I was going along the road, kind of minding my own business as best I can. And as happens from time to time, someone came up alongside me with their window down. It was a warm day, veins popping out of his neck and screamed at me to get the blank off the blanken road. Why are you so angry? Why do you seemingly want to put me in the hospital? And why am I angry that you're angry? A couple of hundred yards on from that little scream fest, the traffic light, of course, turned red. And the screamer was right at the front of the line waiting for the light. I could have rolled up, because his window was open after all, and given him a talking to. Let him know about my rights, about my freedoms, that he is, in fact, his brother's keeper, whether he wants to be or not. Maybe finish my little speech off with a passive-aggressive, peace be with you for good measure. Come on, Dave. You just read the scripture that morning. You just reflected on Augustine. You just remembered Dog Hammerfeld's quote about purpose and meaning, and now you're going to do what exactly? Sometimes you have to reimagine the story, reimagine the possibilities, interrupt the narrative because some narratives need interrupting. Some stories need reshaping. Some realities do need reimagining. Jesus tells us a parable this morning that is a reimagining of another story. He does this quite a bit. Take something familiar and then augment some of the details or twist the ending in a surprising way, usually enabling the finger to be pointed back at his interlocutors. In Isaiah's prophecy, God creates a fertile vineyard, but the grapes become wild instead of well-cultivated. They are useless for making good wine. Israel has been expected to perform acts of justice and righteousness, but instead God's ears ring with crying out and God's eyes see bloodshed. So Jesus takes the words of Isaiah and he reimagines this prophecy. But the question lingers, do people still cry out? Do God's eyes still witness bloodshed? It's undoubtedly a familiar metaphor, but for Israel's people, it's been so long that they had a sense of owning their own land and being the vineyard that was planted by God, that the story requires some updating and amending by Jesus. You need tenants to work the land. Who might that be? Well, there have been all sorts of tenants who have occupied the land over the centuries. Egyptians and Canaanites, Assyrians and Neo-Assyrians, the Greeks and then the Romans, just to name a handful. The vineyard still belongs to God, but others are working the land. And so Jesus tells this parable about representatives being sent by the landowner and are met with violence. There were numerous revolts by Jews. Some unsuccessful, a few that landed some punches for sure, but the cycles of violence kept on repeating themselves. And so you can imagine the hearers of the story anticipating the next move. The owner's son is sent along to make peace. This unsurprisingly proves elusive. If you look again at the parable, you'll see that the tenants' voices make absolutely no sense whatsoever. If you take the parable literally which you shouldn't because it's a parable. But how could the tenants 
claim that the inheritance of the landowner is theirs by killing the son? How could you claim the inheritance is a person who doesn't belong to the family? It only makes sense if it describes the attitude of the tenants, of the occupiers of the land, because they always want more. If the tenants are the occupiers and the occupiers are imperialistic and always want more, they want more taxes and they want more revenue and they want more obedience and they want more temples built and more stadia built and they want more glamour and they want more of everything. They want more power. And the answer then will also always be more violence. Violence even if it doesn't make a darn bit of sense. Violence even if it is totally lacking in compassion or morals. The answer is always more. The tenants want to be the owners when they have no rightful claim to such ownership. And so their response is just what seems to happen when you're in this kind of position. And we saw that play out last weekend in Barcelona. Why on earth would the government in Madrid sanction a response that included rubber bullets and batons? Why on earth would they think that that was the way to garner support for their position? Why would anyone not now be in support of independence for the Catalans, something that they have been crying out for? Why did Madrid behave this way? In a very general sense, I assume it's because that's what empires do. They dismiss the desires of people to be free in part because they need those people to serve their economic needs and interests, pay their taxes, do their part, no matter how unrepresentative of those people the government actually is. It's just what they do. So Jesus tells a story about what they do, how empires behave. And so then the people must ask a reasonable question in response to how empires behave. If this is how empires behave, How should we behave? So Jesus asks his crowd a tantalizing question. When the owner comes, what will he do to those tenants? And the interlocutors say, the owner will put those wretches to a miserable death. An answer that many of us would give in our own way or in our own words. Uh I'd say that it's astonishing that learned elders of the religious community could walk into that rhetorical trap, right? Jesus offers these educated religious people a story where they can break the cycle of violence, even if it is just within the confines of a parable. They have the opportunity to articulate that God is different, that the maker of the universe has the capacity to break cycles of violence and injustice if only God's people would listen and learn, and they don't. Jesus holds up a mirror to the Pharisees, by using one of their own stories from Isaiah and leads them to a place where they again have created a particular kind of violent God that exacts violent revenge on those who do unjust things. The chief priests and the Pharisees, they are not free. We know they are not free because Jesus offers them a counter view, a radical reimagining of what the response might be to these cruel tenants. We sang about it in the Psalter. We sang this reimagined view of the realm of God. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is God's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The righteous, therefore, we sang, shall enter the gate of God. And how will these particular teachers and priests respond, Matthew contends? They want to arrest him, but they feared the crowds. Violence and fear. Whenever people respond in violence and fear, they are not free. This is the irony of what happened in Spain. In an act of desiring freedom on behalf of the Catalans, it was the government of Madrid that behaved in such a way that left them in a form of bondage. It is hard to beat protesters and then walk that back. But I didn't feel free last week either, on Monday, when the small incident happened on my bike. Trapped by another's rage, it took everything that I had to shrug it off and do what I have never done before, 
which is just get off my bike, cross the road, and start pedaling down a different street. Ben asked me this week what my favorite quote is. I didn't think for more than a second. I immediately rattled off. There are three kinds of patriots, two bad, one good. The bad patriots are the uncritical lovers and the loveless critics. Good patriots carry on a lover's quarrel with their country, symbolic of God's lover's quarrel with all the world. William Sloan Coffin. I am a naturalized citizen. I grew up in England when I was little. I wonder sometimes what it means to be patriotic. I wonder what it means to be free. I remember my dad taking me to London Speaker's Corner when I was a kid. People making outrageous arguments from their soapboxes, shouting at anybody who will listen, shouting at people back and forth. Some standing there maligning the queen, others saying that Jesus Christ never existed, and others standing there and bad-mouthing an entire religion. We'd shrug and go back to our regular lives. We were surprised more than 25 years ago when we moved here how patriotism is taken to quote Spinal Tap to 11. Everything's a little more amped up. People are more likely to wear flags on their clothes, use the flag to sell a car, fly the flag from their home. Of course, I'm used to it now. Used to singing the anthem before every single sporting event. Used to removing my hat. Used to wondering about the uncritical lovers who forever talk about being free. America is the most free country in the world, we're told. Even as a kid, I was amazed by that. How could you say such a thing? How could you possibly judge such a thing? Doesn't it depend who you are? I didn't want to light another candle at another vigil this week. I'm sick of this routine. Feeling beholden to this routine. Feeling beholden to the inevitability of it all. Feeling beholden in the land of the free. Feeling beholden to the gun lobby. Feeling beholden to an amendment to our Constitution that is several a couple of hundred years old and is so clear-cut, so easy to interpret that when our Supreme Court did that in Heller versus D.C., of course, of course, it was a five to four decision. This isn't freedom. What we are doing, the way we're going and have been going, it isn't freedom. It is a form of servitude that ensnares our nation. I look to my faith and to God, and I wonder what it is to be free. I ask God why we can't be free, why I can't be free. I pray that we will be free, truly free, and in order to be free in our country, in order to be really free, the land of the free, the guns have got to go. I don't care about the rancher in Wyoming with a shotgun, but from our cities and our suburbs, the guns have got to go. Melt them, trade them, turn them into garden tools. It matters not to me because I want to be free. Free from lighting yet another candle at another vigil for something that was, no matter what some may say, entirely preventable. My prayers are with the families of Newtown whom we have failed. The families of Virginia Tech, whom we have failed. The families of Orlando, whom we have failed. But my prayers are also with the family of kids like Tamir Rice that have been failed. The thousands of people across this country that are killed in ones and twos that don't even make the news anymore. The easy access to guns that enable thousands of people to commit suicide so abruptly. In no small way have their families been failed by our legislators and our citizenry. The best we can do is tweet about thoughts and prayers and maintain the status quo. We are not free. The lover's quarrel must go on. I don't know who or what put the question. I don't know when it was put. I don't even remember answering. But at some moment, I did answer yes to someone or something. And from that hour, I was certain that existence is meaningful and therefore my life and self-surrender had a goal.
could it be? In the land of the free, that the story we must reimagine, the reality that we must recreate, is the nature of freedom itself. May God's peace be with you.